Good morning everybody and welcome to today's webinar on risk assessment and risk management. Today's webinar will be presented by special guest Alex Bedford who is the risk proposition manager and Matthew Hardwick the strategic risk consultant both from Zurich Municipal. Before I give a little bit of background on Alex and Matt, uh, I'm Sarah Jarvis and I'm one of the category, category buyers in corporate and financial services here at YPO. And two of the uh, contracts I look after is uh, insurance brokerage framework and the insurance placement DPS. So I'll just give a little bit of background uh, to Alex and Matt. So Alex Bedford is a is a strategic risk professional with over 16 years experience working both with and within the public sector. Alex's current role involves looking at the key emerging and evolving areas of risk impacting the public sector now and in the future. Talking to risk professionals within the sector about the challenges facing their organisations and working within Zurich to ensure their risk proposition enables their customers to understand and manage these risks effectively. Matt joined as a strategic risk consultant in March 2017 following nearly 10 years experience working in the public sector. During his time in the public sector, Matt worked in a number of roles which focused on contract management, project management before moving into insurance and risk management. Since working within Zurich, Matt has supported a number of customers in developing more robust risk management approaches, including a secondment arrangement, which included rewriting of policies and procedures, as well as establishing a new risk management service. So before we get into the actual webinar, I'd just like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have all joined this webinar in listening mode only, but please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen to ask questions throughout the presentation. We will go back to the questions at the end. For any questions not answered, we will respond to you after this session. So now I'm going to pass over to Alex and Matt for this presentation. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Sarah said, I'm Alex Bedford, Risk Proposition Manager at Zurich Municipal. Um, I'm just going to do the introduction and a bit of context setting today before handing over to Matt um, to take you through the majority of the presentation. So as Sarah said, I've been a risk professional for a long time now. Um, actually, when I thought about it, it's actually nearly 18 years now. Um, and the job that I'm now in, looking at those evolving and emerging risks, um, I moved into that at the beginning of this year and could be heard saying that there had never been a more interesting time to be working in risk as we were dealing with some really big, meaty risks with real uncertainty rather than just stuck issues dressed up as risks. And then obviously COVID-19 happened, so classic case of be careful what you wish for. Um, it became even more interesting um, through the rest of the year. So the last six and a half months have raised awareness um, of how essential, robust and dynamic risk management and risk assessments are to organisational resilience. Looking at the agenda, I'm going to start by looking at some context. Why are we talking about this topic now? And briefly, what lessons can be taken from the last six or more months? I'll then hand over to Matt, who will look at what organisational resilience means, give an overview of what robust and dynamic risk management and risk assessments are in practice, and consider these processes in relation to procurement, given that this is a YPO partnered webinar. Um, and as, again, as Sarah said, we'll finish with some time for Q&A. Um, so if questions occur to you, please do type them in the Q&A box and we will come to them at the end of the presentation. So if I start with some context, um, why are we talking about this topic now? Um, so our awareness and our understanding of the importance of organisational resilience has certainly been tested this year. Um, looking at the pictures, we started 2020 with a focus on climate change and climate action adaptation and mitigation with response to extreme weather at the top of everyone's minds. We saw the devastating Australian bushfires and the storms and floods closer to home here in the UK. 
the end of 2020 was and still will be about Brexit and the impacts that withdrawal from the EU may have on our resilience. And we have an ever increasing dependence on technology and are seeing an associated rise in cyber attacks, meaning cyber and data resilience is also high on agendas. And then, of course, at the beginning of the year, we were hearing about um, this new coronavirus in Wuhan and the Hubei province and the impacts on organisational resilience have built and evolved ever since. Next slide. We are living through the first global pandemic in over 100 years and COVID-19 spread across the world at an unprecedented speed, unprecedented due primarily to the way we now live. You think about 100 years ago now, um, we have much more globally interconnected supply chains, travel routes, institutions and systems. So the virus spread extremely quickly. And the pandemic and the associated lockdowns and restrictions that um, many of us are still living under have triggered an economic crisis with potentially dire societal consequences affecting the lives and livelihoods of most of the global population. And globally, the crisis has exposed fundamental shortcomings in pandemic preparedness, socioeconomic safety nets and global cooperation. And here in the UK, governments and organisations have struggled to address the compounding repercussions in the form of organisational resilience, but also workforce challenges, disruptions in essential supplies. We've had to balance health security imperatives against the economic fallout and rising societal anxieties, while relying on digital infrastructure in unprecedented ways. And the risk management process has been front and centre of decision making through these times. The importance of strong evidence-based and dynamic management of risk has been something we've been emphasising to our customers, that actually proper risk management shouldn't just be a crisis response. It should be integrated into organisational decision making as business as usual. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague Matt to look at this in more detail. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, nice cheery start for a Thursday morning, isn't it? A, a sort of upbeat presentation on uh, all the crisis stuff that's going on at the moment. Um, as, um, as Sarah has alluded to, and, and, and Alex reinforced as well, uh, yeah, management at Hardwick are part of the risk uh, consultant team and, and specialise in that strategic risk consultancy. Um, but prior to working for Zurich, as Sarah mentioned, I, I had a foot in the public sector camp, so um, feel very well balanced, if you like, in terms of being able to share and, and empathise with a lot of your frustrations uh, and, and build um, and, and you know use my ability now to sort of take the opportunity to sort of share knowledge with you and, and your organisations. Before we sort of start, what I'd, what I'd quite like to do is almost take a step backwards and, and start looking around what do we mean by risk management and in particular some sort of key terms that very often crop up. Um, enterprise risk management may be one that you're uh, very aware of, but, but starting off by actually what is risk? What do we mean when we talk about risks? Fundamentally, we're looking at those uncertainties that will have an impact on objectives of organisations. Every organisation exists to achieve its objectives and the risks are those potential threats that, that could impact on that achievement. Risk management, uh, as you then expect, is that coordinated approach uh, to having some control around those risks and what is it we're, we're sort of implementing to ensure that that, uh, that risk is, is mitigated, is managed to the most appropriate level. And then finally, enterprise risk management, as I say, might be a phrase that, that some of you are very familiar with. Uh, for some of you, may may not be, potentially. Uh, and what we're actually meaning when we talk about enterprise risk management is having all stakeholders having a voice in the approach to managing risk. Essentially, it's trying to remove those historic silos. We don't want information to be managed in certain departments and, and no one sort of shares it and uh, has that collaborative view. Um, so in a sense, we're looking at what is our business strategy um, and how, how are risks impacting on that and where are we gonna get to? Again, just sort of setting some almost ground rules, if you like. Um, this particular slide on the screen, um, we use within Zurich, and it's, it's a relatively simple tool around trying to measure an organization's risk maturity. 
I won't ask you to sort of name and shame and shout up within the uh, within the chat function as to where you might perceive your own organisation to be. Um, but it's a really, really good tool to be able to perhaps consider your own organisation, have a look at some of the key points that are on the screen. Think about where you might perceive yourselves to be. Once you know where you are, you're then able to easily identify where you need to get to and what sort of tools and techniques are the next steps, if you like. For example, there's there's no point at the at the outset trying to embed a, a fully integrated risk management approach where risks are very proactive in how they're managed, monitored and reviewed. Um, if actually when you look at this curve, you consider yourselves to be at the bottom end of the matrix, uh, bottom end of the curve there. So it's about that incremental steps and, and achieving and taking officers uh, on a journey through risk management. And hopefully some of the tools that we'll talk about today are obviously directed at, at both risk management, but linking it back into procurement and how that sort of works for us. When we're, when we're talking about risks uh, and risk management and sort of thinking now about your own risks and risk registers that you might have within your, your organisation, thinking about actually what is it we're articulating and what are we defining as our risk? Uh, and, and someone like myself as a risk management professional, we sort of revert to these four orders of risks. Uh, and I'll, I'll try and talk them through it and, and hopefully give an example that, that makes it relatively sort of simple, brings it to life a little bit. Um, when we're talking about direct damage under the first order, we are talking about literally the physical damage to your property. So, for example, um, we might have a flood uh, and that causes us to close the building. In closing the building, it's closed. The flooding damage needs to be taken care of. So that's our direct damage. The second order is the consequences of shutting the building. So we might have lost productivity if it was a factory for argument's sake uh, and we've had to shut down, uh, shut down the uh, the factory uh, to deal with the flood but we've also lost that productivity. Those two areas of risk tend to be the easiest ones to identify because it's very very simple for us and, and you know human minds naturally work in that sort of disaster scenario of okay what happens if uh, and so those two orders generally fairly fairly easy to, to comprehend and articulate. When we move into our third and fourth orders, we start to get to um, sort of more grey areas that are often overlooked. And actually, um, some of you might be familiar with the, the sort of terminology or the concept of total cost of risk. Uh, and this is about how uh, you know actions at the front end can have long tail implications to them. So moving into those third order, indirect economic losses. We might lose some market share. So our factory that we've flooded, that we've had to shut the doors on, and we're no, no longer able to uh, deliver whatever came out of our factory doors, we're now potentially losing market share because we're unable to, uh, to provide for our customers. Our customers are going elsewhere. Um, and when we are able to eventually reopen, we're not in the same position that we perhaps closed our doors as a result of, uh, as a result of the, the flooding that happened. And then finally, these are our long-term consequences. So if we lose our market share, is there a position, uh, is there a possibility that our business is no longer viable going forward? Uh, and all we're trying to do when we're looking at risks is if we identify them and articulate risks with each of those areas in mind, our ability to consider the management actions and proportional management actions is so much easier because we've got a full view of what we consider the risk to be. And it's important to think that those third and fourth order could be six, 12 months down the line. And I think if we think of the pandemic and how that has changed the way that we're all working at the moment and the way that our organisations are working, you know, direct damage at the, in the start of the crisis was around, okay, statutory duties, delivery of those statutory duties. Uh, what, is, what do we need to do? What do we not need to do? Where are areas that we can uh, possibly shelve for the, period, for the short period of time? And then as we move into that recovery, what are those long-term consequences around trying to recover our business back to normal? I will start, during the thread of this presentation, I'll sort of refer back to some of these bits, but I think those four orders are, are quite key for us. And certainly concept of total cost risk is something I'll touch on slightly later on. So Alex mentioned that uh, at the start, we we're gonna look around organization resilience. And uh, you know, as with any good thing, let's define it in the start um, and what do we mean by organization resilience what we're trying to ascertain if you like is a resilience of an organization is its ability to prepare for and respond to those changes that, that might happen 
they could be incremental um, or they could be extremely sudden disruptions. What we're trying to ensure is organisations that have got a strong resilience are able to survive and prosper. They are the ones that are most flexible, they deal with those changes, and they are the ones that will come out of any change scenario much stronger. Um, we've only, you know, again, the pandemic's been a great example of this. There's a number of organisations that have really struggled for a variety of reasons. Uh, and those ones that are struggling are the less resilient organisations. They, they might have very narrow business models and their supply has been just totally stripped away from them. Therefore, they're totally unable, unable to flex and move into new opportunities. And, and you know, they're perhaps downsized or in some cases, potentially even closed. So once we know what resilience is and how we're trying to look at it and, and what, what we're trying to define, we can start to consider how to improve it. And if I link this back to the maturity curve that was on the screen, um, some of the slides previous, uh, and that, that sort of incremental uh, view, we can start to think around, actually, if we have good business practices and we effectively manage our risk within an organisation, that will lead us to a much stronger business resilience. So again, that, that maturity curve, if we've got an aware organisation where perhaps our, our risk documentation is very poor or it's inconsistent, uh, different teams, different departments are doing different things. Those organisations, history tellers, will be the ones that are going to struggle when a, a situation arises that causes the organisation to deviate from its current path. Through to the transformational organisations where risk management is very well embedded, uh, as is uh, all, to, all other areas that, that sort of touch into to organisation resilience, they'll be the ones that, that recover the most, uh, most strongly and um, return back to normal. What I've tried to demonstrate on the screen here is uh, we've got some key pillars uh, around risk management. Um, and I think there's multiple areas. And again, I'm not going to ask you to sort of put your hands up and think of your own organisations or, or sort of tell stories or, or ideas around your own organisations. <clears throat> but these are potentially opportunities to start considering how we can improve them. If we're aware of what our pillars are and where we need to focus and, and what does good look like if you if you want to consider it in that sort of sense we can start to tackle areas where perhaps our own organizations are more weaker than others uh, and just pulling out a couple of them um, and, and sort of giving some some sort of more detail around them the, the second one in from the top the understanding of organizations context I said at the start around you know what was our business objectives where is it we're trying to get to Organisations will have corporate plans that potentially have a, a five year lifespan to them. What's happening now and how is that going to impact on those long term objectives? Are we needing to shift? Are we needing to change? We've seen lots of organisations who business plans, uh, financial models have been ripped up, thrown out the window because the current pandemic has forced that change. Organisations where there's perhaps resiliency built in, it might be in a financial sense, reserves uh, that are available or tapping into government help, government support, allow those organisations to continue to work, continue to adapt and flex and move uh, as the, the situation demands it. Um, effective risk management, as a risk consultant, it would be naive of me to, to not mention this, but and it, it absolutely plays a, a fundamental part in ensuring a resilience within an organisation. Um, but what we're really referring to here is, are policies in place within your organisation? Are those policies reflective of what actually goes on or are they just words on a piece of paper? Think about your risk registers. Are they regularly reviewed? Are they challenged, updated? Again, link it back to that maturity curve that I had on the screen earlier on. The good organisations will be the one that do a lot of that in that work, um, almost subconsciously. Uh, and risk underpins a lot of decision making and, and certainly it's what we're striving for and Alex alluded at the start you know some of the context areas that we've seen at the start of the year and how that moves on risk management underpins a lot of the good work that goes on within organizations and, and this is very much sort of sharing that best practice uh, through yourselves so again um, on the screen, I've got uh, sort of more, you know, broadening out what we mean by resilience and looking at some of the key areas. Uh, and I'm, I won't go into all of them. Um, I could do, I could talk for hours on some of these topics. Um, when, we, when we look at this, from, or from, when I look at this, um, culture 
of an organization is one that really sort of springs out and it, it incorporates into many elements of this be that leadership be it the, the shared vision and, and having that key understanding around where our organization is trying to get to um, are we are we embracing that culture and, and building in that sort of uh, that best practice and that excellence that we want from from ourselves from our staff and from our supply chains as well and um, certainly for yourselves and, and YPO and, and members through YPO and, and working in the sort of procurement field partners and supply chain has been a key area that I think the pandemic has thrown up for us um, some organizations have as I said earlier have struggled are they are they part of our own supply chain do we know that they're struggling um, do we have that clear view, clear knowledge of um, what our suppliers are dealing with and, and what their own longer um, sort of aspirations are? Do we know where we sit in terms of upstream and downstream when it comes to suppliers? As, particularly as local authorities, it's, it's very likely that you could sit both upstream and downstream um, in terms of having suppliers that are providing services for you, but then stuff that you are actually the, the contractor and your your Potentially delivering on behalf of others. Um, so again, understanding understanding your own position, understanding the organisations that you're working with will help to uh, build your own resilience, build your own strength. But I think there's some key areas on there that um, that certainly are worth worth understanding, worth knowing. Reputation, finances, etc. As I say, could could go into some of these areas for for quite uh, quite some time. So why are we wanting to address it? Um, and, and I think that again the pandemic has given us a bit of a catalyst uh, and, and people are starting to consider risk management and it's getting a far stronger voice within organisations which, which is absolutely great. I've tried to break down some areas of resilience into sort of four key areas. Fundamentally the world is continuing to evolve. Things like the demands on technology are driving organisations. We're all sat Potentially at home, looking at a computer screen, whereas historically we might have delivered this session all in person um, at YPO's offices or, or you know, wherever at a conference venue. Being able to come to achieve those um, those changes and, and ensure that people are still able to work, technology has underpinned it. Uh, if we think about changing the environment and keeping pace, we've obviously got Brexit very much on the horizon. Uh, I was talking to people recently uh, and they were concerned around potential changes to future OGU um, arrangements and how that might look for a procurement world art. You know, is the UK going to take its own view and its own steer and therefore how do we have to sort of flex and, and make sure that we're able to continue to operate within the, the legal boundaries that we have to. Uh, and supply chains mentioned earlier on in terms of they could be becoming more complex. Uh, organizations are starting to work on a much more global scale rather than perhaps historically working uh, more within a more localized boundary and um, during the pandemic actually I was talking to an organization who um, have, have outsourced an element of their uh, provision they provide they were providing mental health services uh, and they're starting to provide those services over the phone due to the you know restrictions on being able to see people uh, and they found that actually they've been able to outsource that service and, and get a contractor in who's delivering it from their home location. Uh, they're actually based abroad um, within Europe. And the theory being, as long as they have a strong internet connection, they can dial in, they can continue to satisfy and deliver that service. But it starts throwing up new risks for them and new considerations. And it may well be that organisations might be approaching you uh, and wanting to steer on, can we run tenders that possibly widens our boundaries uh, of people that we might want to work for and work with. I've mentioned risk culture a couple of times. Um, and I suppose, what, what is it we mean by risk culture? And, and I really like this diagram. It's, it's from the Institute of Risk Management. Um, and it, it's a relatively simple ABC model. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is how attitudes of all staff, and, and very often that's you know, led from the tone at the top, that will then shape the behavior which forms the culture and then that culture then feeds back and influences those other elements. And I think we can all relate to it within our own organizations. When we're thinking of you know, organizations that we want to work with and work for, we want that strong culture. We want a culture that's positive and it's open and it's embracing. And to further emphasize it, I've tried to break it down into some key themes, key aspects. I've alluded to that tone at the top. 
have we got a clear direction from our leaders? Do we know what it is that we're trying to achieve as, as an organisation? If we're a, a large public sector organisation, what is our corporate plan saying to us? What, what are we trying to achieve in the next five years? Conversely, what's, what's the attitude towards bad news from that tone at the top? Are leaders of our business, are they welcoming of that disclosure? Uh, do they embrace that challenge and embrace that change? Or is it more risk averse? Do barriers come up if there's something that's going wrong? Again, understanding where we are, linking it back to that maturity curve as I keep mentioning. Um, knowing where you are knows where then we need to sort of further look and further improve. I won't go through the other elements on the screen, but you can you can sort of see these and reference them. And certainly when the, the slides and the contents uh, are sent on to you after this session, uh, there's a reference tool back there around some of the areas around governance, competency, etc. Um, and what I've tried to do on this particular one is start to think about, okay, what, what does good look like? What is it worth striving for? What's the best practice? As you'd imagine, and, and some of you may be thinking of your own organisations thinking, yeah, we absolutely have that, which is great. But senior managers, we want them to be visible. Uh, whenever there's a, a significant incident that arises, um, and we need to be giving clear communications coming from the right people and giving that, that sort of understanding and that recognition of how risk is managed across the organisation. Looking at governance, we want those accountabilities, we want the right people to be available to, to liaise with and, and deal with um, issues that arise within the organisation. And, and they should be captured within you know, role descriptions, job descriptions, linked into performance targets, in the same way that we managed other aspects of uh, individuals working lives. So often when uh, when we work with, with customers, risk can be sometimes a bit of a bolt-on type role uh, and it's being delivered in conjunction with other roles and responsibilities and it whilst it can be done it, it needs its, it needs some time it needs you know a bit of dedication towards actually what are we trying to to achieve and what are the accountabilities entrusted on the individuals doing those roles. And finally the decision making Organisations' willingness. So, so some people might refer to this as risk appetite, risk tolerance levels. Any of those are absolutely fine. Uh, but understanding what your organisation is prepared to accept, is prepared to tolerate, will allow future moulding and, and future decisions, and, and will allow you to steer the organisation uh, into those decision making and making sure that we're getting the right areas. Um, one thing I've noticed with customers talking to me from the pandemic is how, uh, particularly in public sector. I think there's a, a collective challenge is starting to be um, occurring across lots of organisations around the level of appetite that public sector organisations were prepared to tolerate. Um, historically, we're, we're perhaps seen and seen, saw themselves as very risk averse. Um, as the crisis has, has hit and developed and, and morphed into what it is now, actually lots of those organisations are starting to say, do you know what, we, we took on more risks than we perhaps envisaged that we ever would um, and so as, as the recovery stage is coming through and, and organizations are re returning back to normal be that working remotely or whatever but one of the first co topics conversation i'm having with some of my customers is around okay we perhaps need to have a rethink on our risk appetite because when the chips were down we were prepared to tolerate more than than what we previously envisaged that we would and that comes back into our decision making and it all links into the culture which is uh, quite a nice example. So, done a little bit on the, the sort of risk culture and organisation resilience and, and now looking more uh, focused on supply chain uh, and clearly some of you on the call are going to be more closely aligned to procurement and supply chain risk assessments are likely to be part of your own key risk assessments. This is not where I'm going to try and teach you how to do your own job um, and, and some of the elements on the screen you'll absolutely be able to recognise. Um, for me, some of the key areas, what we're trying to strive when we're talking around sort of supply chain risk assessment, we're striving for elimination of those surprises. We want to, where possible, have tried to envisage what, what do we mean, what could go wrong, what could happen. This allows our own organisation to continue towards progressing towards its goals and as such naturally builds that resilience, that agility that we've already spoken about. It also enables us to take opportunities. I, 
opportunity is a, is a key element to, to risk, which is very often overlooked, particularly, um, I have to say, in the public sector. I say that as an ex-public sector employee myself, um, but risk is very often seen as the, the negatives uh, and the, the, the threats and, and you know the really bad stuff that's going to happen. Whereas actually, there's always that flip side. There's always a positivity. And, and it's why we take on decisions and why we look to embrace certain elements and certainly any of you that are familiar with um, projects and, and writing business cases and those sorts of things you'll be extremely familiar with trying to articulate pros and cons of decisions and that is all we're striving for when it comes to risk is, is reviewing risks on that the pro and the con and, and what are the potential benefits here and very often supply chain and, and looking at contractors is, is a really good example because it could be that that contractor is able to deliver a service um, in a way that we can't um, be that for price, be that for quality, uh, all those elements and that's why we fundamentally look to embrace them but knowing those organisations uh, and knowing how they how risky they are uh, in, in that contract is obviously a key, key area for us to consider. When we, uh, when we Talk around resilience uh, and supply chain, it, it'd be absolutely amiss of us to not consider business continuity. Um, history shows us that organisations that have got very strong, clear business continuity plans will be the organisations that recover more quickly, but also recover back to a level of historic performance. So the, the graph on the screen, the, the line starts at number one, which is our normal productivity for this particular organization we've then got our event that happens that plunges us into crisis mode emergency mode um, and if we if we take the colored lines through we can see that the orange line shows a degree of sort of salvage and restoration where our productivity is a lot lower than normal uh, and the time obviously ticking away uh, on the bottom axis uh, and then we move into that recovery mode and lots of organizations are going through this at the moment as part of the pandemic um, those where we've got Organisations where we've seen good resiliency models, and it, that could be anything from you know, strong IT packages that have enabled staff to work from home almost from day one, through to uh, clear supply chains that have equally you know, uh, strong levels of resiliency within them. Those organisations start to become that red dotted line that you can see on the screen whereby they're recovering much quicker uh, and recovering back up to normal uh, and starting to continue to deliver historic levels of productivity uh, much earlier than some organisations that are perhaps at the bottom end of that maturity curve and uh, are still struggling. Uh, we've certainly seen lots of organisations that are both good and bad. Uh, there's, there's sort of no definitive example, if you like, but uh, you'll be able to think of your own organisations, think of perhaps areas where there's future developments. I mentioned uh, supply chain and, and how this is very much something that is uh, your bag for a lot of people on the call and listening in uh, and you'll be very aware of you know supply chain uh, self-assessment uh, supply chain risk assessments uh, what I've pulled together here are, are, are 10 quick questions I'm not going to go through and again I won't ask you to sort of you know show virtual hands and all that sort of thing um, they are fairly simple yes no questions and they're a really good opportunity when you when you sort of take away and have a look at these start scoring them yourselves and, and answering them yes or no and at the end of it you'll you'll come to you know we've answered six or seven yes or, or maybe more um, and it gives you a rough idea as to your own organization's position um, and where your your risks likely likely are um, you know i've said on here if, if you're getting eight to ten of those that you're answering yes to then yeah you're, you're probably in a really good position you probably have a fairly sound understanding uh, and a control of of those risks that you face uh, and then as you go down the scale heaven forbid if you're in a position where you're potentially not answering any of them or only a couple of them then uh, i suppose it's it's good luck um, you know there are definitely then opportunities to improve and develop that and, and look at some of those areas and, and start to try and think about how we can improve them across your own organizations there are a number of controls available when it comes to managing contractors um, again many of these that you'll be very very familiar with uh, if you've answered that those previous self-assessment questions and you've perhaps not got as many as you wanted or needed to um, perhaps have a consideration around these key controls are we are we utilizing as many as we can um, again perhaps have a think around our tone at the top what's the culture within the organization 
are we looking to embrace um, embrace those challenges or, or is it indeed potentially one of relief that we've got over the hurdle and we've perhaps dodged a bullet uh, and if that's the case then some of these key controls are they working for us if they're not working for us why not and we need to perhaps understand them uh, and then also are there other areas where we can perhaps utilize more of, more of a review uh, and work with uh, all of our organization and indeed our customers our contractors to, to ensure that we're building that resilience into our organization benefits of um these are very much things that, that you'll be striving for when, whenever we get into any uh, contract situation and we're, we're working with with a provider um, we're trying to strive towards ensuring all of these things ideally are in place uh, and in, in ensuring all of them are in place we're going to build that resilience into our organization so service delivery that's what we're trying to to ensure that continues to happen whether that's a service internally for our staff for example you know an IT contract where um, it's providing all the IT services. We want to ensure that that stands up when it's tested. As I mentioned earlier, the pandemic being a great example of staff suddenly working from home rather than being in offices. We want to ensure they can all still log on and get into the files and systems that they need to. But also potentially our customers and, and you know uh, the public out there that, that interact with our organisations. We want to ensure that the service that we provide to them isn't disrupted and it may well be right? it's delivered still by a third party. We need to have confidence that that third party is able to continue to deliver. And again, my challenge would be when you have perhaps have a look at this and, and as you are doing on the screen, if they're not being realised as benefits within your own organisation, then why not? And what can we do to start to try and um, ensure that we do begin to achieve some of these benefits? It may well be that actually we've got problems with contractors and um, it, you know, we may not have envisaged those problems arising when, as and when they did. Um, there are ways of looking at future early warning signs, if you like, when it comes to contractor management. And what we're trying to build is a bit of a framework around our early warning signs and, and ensuring that we maintain some close relationships with our contractors. And these are, these are not definitive there may be more there may be others that you've experienced but these are certainly common ones that we've come across and, and i've come across in my time when contractors are perhaps just starting to they might still be delivering a service for us that is absolutely fine but we might start be hearing things in the media for example be that local media or national media that's impacting that particular organization and um, uh, one of my common ones is around communications you know, are people suddenly difficult to get hold of or difficult to tie down to come to meetings, to attend, uh, to provide the information that they should be providing against KPIs? If that's the case, as contract managers listening, it, that starts to become a little red flag that says, OK, there's a risk here that, that's just feeling a little bit like it's bubbling away. It might not be yet the red risk that we need to escalate right through the organisation, but it just gives us a little flavour. Uh, and and as, a, as, you know, strong risk management techniques taking that flavor uh, and starting to articulate it and starting to understand it and, and build your horizon scanning opportunity and looking at what the future might start looking like uh, will ensure that our own organization uh, is resilient it does have that agility to move and flex in the event that the worst case scenario might happen so after all that sort of negativity uh, and we, you know, we started off with the with the bushfires uh, down in Australia. We've moved into pandemic and the, the sort of crisis situation that we're in. What I think it does give us, and lots of organisations uh, are certainly reflecting this at the moment themselves. And, and your own organisation, you might be starting to think of, of examples where actually we're, what we're moving back into as we start to recover is possibly a slightly better service provision than what we had previously. And some of that is because the pandemic has created this catalyst. Um, I was talking to an organisation, they were public sector, um, who were saying, we've managed to move mem all members onto uh, remote technology teams, uh, uh, Zoom calls, those sorts of things, where six months ago, this was a absolute pipe dream. There was no way that we were gonna get those people engaged at that level. Because now people have had to get engaged via uh, electronic uh, means and, and technology, actually that's starting to shift at the way that the organization works decisions are potentially being made quicker and, and people are easily 
uh, available and they are embracing the way that that, that does work uh, and certainly is something that organizations are very keen to replicate going forward so think about what you've got at the moment think about where you are and what can we do and what can we continue to do to ensure that what we build as we as we return to our organization and, and we go through the recovery stages can we make sure it is better i mentioned earlier on around total cost of risk and, and this is something i think that, that links nicely into building back better um total cost of risk as a concept now this is one slide i, I think I, I did a, a whole presentation on this recently uh, with 3zn um, which is available on our website a little shameless plug um but um this one slide sort of gives a neat context if you like around what we mean by total cost of risk and and, and again it's that resilience total cost of risk is often referred to as an iceberg whereby what we see at the top is 20 percent of costs so in the top left hand box we've got tangible costs so things like insurance costs audit costs staffing costs training etc budget management they are easily identifiable as a risk uh, and a value that we can quantifiably put against it what we then move into are those intangible areas where we're perhaps leaning on goodwill and reputation it's very difficult to start putting values on these things a lots of organizations we're talking to at the moment we're doing some horizon scanning work and organizations are coming to us and saying we've been overwhelmed with how well staff have coped with the pandemic and dealing with it but we're now concerned that staff are on the verge of burning out that goodwill has been exhausted and staff are now in a position where if this continues for x amount of time and we as an organization don't shift and don't change then we could be creating sort of long tail problems for us ourselves. Um, I mentioned at the start around those four orders of risks and those intangible costs elements make up those third and fourth orders, those consequences, those indirect economic costs potentially. Um, you know, we, we might be aware of um, areas that, that are naturally going to cost us money. You know, if we don't deliver something against the KPI, then that might have a contractual element. But long term, that might mean that we're seen as less reliable uh, there's a reduction in confidence in the market wanting to work with us wanting to engage with us and indeed if we long term if we fail to achieve our objectives uh, as an organization does that put us in a particularly difficult position uh, going forward as i say it's a concept that i could talk for hours on rather than just one slide but i was keen to sort of link it in because uh, i think it links nicely to those four orders of risk it, it builds around resilience builds around um, organization change some of those key topics that we've talked about this morning I think before I go into Q&A um, I have I've tried to put up some quick wins around uh, resilience and how can we make ourselves better and how can we look to improve I've broken it down into five key areas governance think of your own organizations do you have a clear strategy are those does that strategy include clear targets do staff know what it is that we're trying to achieve where we're trying to get to risk management as a as another topic do you have that strategic view is it given the right level of engagement at the top table are you looking at future risks things like the pandemic has, has surprised lots of organizations but there are some that had you know pandemic diseases as a risk whether they fully thought or believed that it was going to be as wide scale as what it has obviously turned out to be um, but within your own organization what what might happen in six months time that is possibly you know a bit of a black swan event for you at the moment in terms of you've not really given it much thought because we're still dealing with the here and now embrace risk management they can provide lots of key information around what's going on at, at the, the global scale Alex mentioned early on around those, you know, the fires in Australia. What impact does that have? Are we, have we got supply chain issues that, that could be impacted by what's going on outside of our own local boundary? Cyber uh, mentioned technology underpins a lot of the work that we have done. So what does our digital strategy tell us? Does it need updating? Do we embrace things like bring your own devices? If not, are staff using their own device at the moment and logging into to systems? So do we need to, to perhaps review that, perhaps update it? Um, and who owns cyber within the organization? Is it that bolt on into somebody's job description? 
Um, if it is, then actually, do we need to review those job descriptions, make sure that those uh, governance arrangements, those key accountabilities are documented. Um, mentioned about staffing and you know keeping staff motivated, keeping staff engaged, a really great way of being able to do it is, is embracing training opportunities. It may well be that they continue to be things like webinars such as this, but ensuring that staff have got that ability to share knowledge with colleagues, share knowledge outside of their own organisation, We'll, we'll keep that motivation. Keeping staff on side and keeping that goodwill will support the agility of the organisation when it's needed and you can lean on your staff. And then finally, supply chain. Do we know what our supply chain is, who our key contractors are? Um, you know, we've got key risk assessments on those ones. Um, do we have an over-reliance potentially on some areas? If we've not, if we've got a broad network and we're comfortable with it, then then that's absolutely great. Uh, and those of you who are able to answer yes to that and are able, even able to consider risks uh, associated to your suppliers in terms of where they're potentially located, um, then you are very much at the top end of that maturity curve that we were showing earlier on, because those transformational organisations not only understand their own risks, but understand the risks of people that they're working with and organisations they work with. So, I think I'm about at Q&A. As a bit of a conclusion, what I just wanted to reference is people are COVID fatigue, I've heard referenced quite a lot recently, and, and I think it's absolutely true. People haven't been able to take the holidays that they thought they were going to be taking in January time. Um, you know, this new normal, uh, a phrase that I detest personally, uh, but we are what we will build back to and what we will recover back to will probably look different to what our job and where we worked as a, as a physical location uh, back at the start of the year so okay how do we how do we make sure that we bring all our staff on that journey and, and we make sure that we are suitably prepared uh, and then as a, as a shameless plug from from myself and from Alex on behalf of Zuri uh, we've got a, a number of sort of risk insights and, and risk information risk management information that's available on our website uh, the link is there feel free to have a look at it and download any areas that are useful to you. They are free to use whether you are a customer of Zurich or not. Um, I think we're now into q and I'm hoping I'm going to look at my uh, colleagues on the call to see whether we've had any that we can answer. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we've got Zuri and Zuri are you going to come in? I saw you nodding <laughs> um, away there. But um, in terms of Q&A, I can't see much on my screen. I've got a few here. Shall I go with them? Okay. Um, so uh, just to reiterate though, if anyone uh, wants to ask a question, there's the Q&A function or the chat function at the bottom um, if you want to pose questions uh, to us. Um, so Matt, um, I, you touched on lots of different areas of risk. I think we've had a question um, about business continuity plans. So reconsidering business continuity plans currently, updating them to reflect events, um, but how do you keep them manageable? Um, so how do you reflect the continuity needed for any future pandemic type events, but also keep them manageable so they're still useful for a single site event, for example? I think for me, when it comes to business continuity, and, and, and I apply this to all my risk management is, um, if you keep it simple uh, and it will aid you long term um, for business continuity, knowing what your key service deliverables are. So what are your key um, areas that have to main, have to be maintained and, and understanding you know, things like recovery time objectives and um, what parts of that of your organization need to be recovered. If you if you keep it simple, keep it scaled down. You can then it then works whether that is a, a a small scale you know loss of a floor within an office building right through to we've lost all sites because there's a pandemic and we've had to shut all of our um, operations if you like um, so yeah keep it small keep it simple don't try and envisage every single potential uh, risk because you'll create a business continuity plan that is just you know far too thick you'll not be able to pick it up. Um, let alone read it at the time of need. Um, understand what those key services are, understand what your recovery times objectives are and, and take it from there. 
Thank you. And um, we've had a couple of questions about the slides. Sarah, can you answer that? Yeah, the slides will uh, will follow after the uh, webinar. It'll probably be either tomorrow or Monday when I send them out to everybody. Fabulous. So I think we had three people asking that. So thank you for that. Um, uh, right. Uh, you may or may not be able to answer this, Matt. Sorry. <laughs> um, but the, we've had a couple of questions um, in from one person. Can you recommend a decent um, uh, RIMS so, uh, management information system for storing risk management documents? I know it's something we're looking at. It is. Um, so there are there are countless uh, out there. In I I wouldn't like to point you in the direction of, of any one because it depends on your own organisation, depends on the scale. Um, it is something that Zurich are looking at globally for all of our customers, and, and potentially there's there's a future product offering that, that Zurich will sort of put our name to, if you like, and, and say that uh, we believe that this is something. Um, that we recommend uh, but again it's it's knowing your own organization what might fit for one organization may be too big too complex for somewhere else um, so what is it that you I suppose understand what it is that you want and need it for um, there are things in the market out there at the moment that you can pick up for uh, probably less than ten thousand pounds in terms of licenses and, and um, for you know multiple users and admin rights and all those sorts of things uh, and then you can go right through and get something that is 10 times that much uh, but will link into performance reporting and uh, all sorts of other elements within the organization it, it it depends what you want what you're after if you are wanting glorified spreadsheets um go to the cheaper end of the market okay I have it. Yeah, so I, like Matt, used to work as a risk manager in the public sector and it's something we were always looking at. My main comment on it um, was that at the organisation I was at, we weren't mature enough to put in a risk management information system because we weren't keeping up to date with what we had already. So um, I wanted to get the organisation into a place where what they were producing was good enough to then go in, be systemised and automated. Um, but yeah, as uh, Matt says, there are a lot out there. Um, we don't have a relationship with any one supplier at the moment, so recommending is difficult for us. Um, but yeah, uh, talking to your peers, that was the other thing that I did a lot of on yeah. that, um, about what they're using, how they're using it, what they like and don't like um, in other organisations. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, so I, I'm going to read out there as an observation, um, if you want to uh, make any comments on it, Matt. So I think the relationship with the supply network is a two-way street organizations need to be a good customer too absolutely yeah, yeah i totally agree um and then sorry there's something in the chat uh, so, but similar to that what is your opinion on the management of third party contractors <sighs> yeah how long is a string um i it depends again it, it sort of depends on your own organization depends on the, the third party that you are contracting with and working with um it, it might that might be one where i say i might respond having had a bit of time to think on it rather than um trying to think on the hoof apologies <laughs> thank you um and then i i think i'll have to take this one unless you want to matt let me know um, how would you assess the resilience of the of an insurance company? <laughs> okay, um, so I mean, it's a, an insurance company is a supplier. Um, so all the stuff in the presentation that Matt um, said around your supply chain criteria, um, how you manage the relationship through, etc., um, comes into play um, with an insurance company. So obviously, being from an insurance company. So the things that we would see as important um, when you're looking at our resilience um, is so things like um, longevity in the market. Um, so in some markets you have insurers who come in um, and then come out depending on whether it's a hard or a soft market. So you might get good prices, but would you get that longevity? So um, in terms of resilience, which is what we're talking about, um, so stickability, um, that history in the market, um, uh, is one thing. Um, financial rating um, is important. So, I mean, particularly as we're going into an economic um, lull, uh, or so everyone tells us, 
Um, so their financial rating, their capitalisation, um, how they fare against Solvency 2, etc. So um, how resilient they are that way. And then actually insurance companies will all have their own supply chains um, that you as a customer um, will call on. Um, when you have an event and you may be aware or unaware of what those supply chains are so depending on whether you've had an event if you've had a flood you will know whether your insurance company has access to things like temporary buildings and um, drying equipment etc um, if you haven't you may just never you, you may never have looked at it in detail but how um, resilient their own supply chains are where they're sourced from what happens if they have a major surge event um, all those things so that's just three areas um, to start with about um, uh, the resilience of an insurance company particularly. Um, right, we've had another one. Um, any specific tips on checking the financial resilience of suppliers of different sizes and length of trading, i.e. how to do this for new suppliers? So I guess this is about, um, and I think in the public sector particularly, we're often challenged um, on uh, moving away from sort of the traditional big suppliers and moving to more local, more startups, um, more social enterprise type things. So any, any specific tips on how you look at the financial resilience of uh, those kind of suppliers as opposed to traditional suppliers, I guess. Uh, I suppose as much as anything, it's about building relationships with potential suppliers. Um, and as part of those relationships, it, it may well be that they are a small organisation or potentially a new organisation. Getting a feel for how those those By you get a written response and then you have to try and judge it. Um, it's about assessing risk. It's about getting a, a feel and, and utilising lots of stakeholders within your own organisation uh, rather than it just being an individual judgment. You know, create that network and, and build your safety net. Um, there's, I don't think there's any straight simple rule because uh, you know a, a new organisation or a small organisation is uh, is going to struggle to potentially provide you know 10 15 years worth of accounts if they may not exist uh, but that doesn't mean that they should be overlooked in a process if they actually can deliver uh, and you believe that they can deliver the, the service that you are wanting them to deliver okay thank you for that answer <laughs> um okay so I can't see any other questions coming in and we're nearly at time, Sarah, um, so, to wrap up. Yeah, so I'd, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Alex and Matthew for today's webinar. I hope you all found it really, really useful. I know I have. But if anybody attending have got any questions, just drop us a line to the insurance at ypo.co.uk uh, inbox and we'll uh, respond to those, uh, any other questions that, uh, that you've got. Um, within uh, 24 hours of you raising the question. So again, I've just noticed the time. I think it's time that we need to wrap up. Um, but again, thank you to Alex and Matt. It's been absolutely brilliant for you to do this. We really, really appreciate it. And I'd just like to wish everybody to enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.